It's April 21st, 1934, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. If I ask you now the question, what does the Loch Ness Monster look like? The chances are that your brain is currently reproducing a grainy black and white image of a long-necked elasmosaurus-y looking thing sticking its head up from the water, which you probably saw in a book when you were a kid. That is the photo published on this day in 1934 by the Daily Mail in a sensational front page splash which warned the notorious monster was, quote, yards from the lock side. And the legend can actually be traced all the way back to the first century AD when Romans arrived in northern Scotland and saw the picked tribes' depictions of what to them was this unrecognisable animals. And Romans described it as a strange beast with an elongated beak or muzzle, a head locket or spout, and flippers instead of feet, which is remarkably close to kind of the image that we have thanks to this picture. But then modern interest was really sparked in 19. 1933, when first of all, a guy called George Spicer went for a drive with his wife through the Scottish Highlands, and the couple saw a large, unfamiliar creature pass in front of their car and then disappear into Loch Ness, and he described it as the nearest approach to a dragon or prehistoric animal that I have ever seen in my life, and as having a long neck again, which moved up and down in the manner of a scenic railway, which I found quite curious. (laughs) Um, But then that got picked up by the Courier newspaper, which published a report of this sighting, and that sighting then triggered other sightings and onward it rolled to this moment. Yeah, this was kind of one of those goofy 1930s things. You know, they were really big on crazes and manias, weren't they, in the 20s and 30s. And suddenly, at this point, 1933 and then 1934, there's this full explosion of Nessie mania. Well, it's funny that it is 1934, actually, because, you know, we're just two days on from our conversation about Shirley Temple the other day, which was also 1934. So this happened two days on from the release of Stand Up and Cheer. I don't want to sort of labour the comparison <laughs> between Loch Ness and Innocent <laughs> Child. Where is this going? What is the connection? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that Nessie fills some of the same function as that irritating showbiz uh, <laughs> trend. Go on. Yes. In the, it, it was the depression, wasn't it? And people needed cheering up and distraction and fun. Okay. And I think, in a way, people were turning to stories of the Loch Ness Monster in Britain in the same way that Americans were looking at Shelley Temple. It was just like, just give me something else, just anything else that we can like all have an opinion on. Yeah, and I mean, no one has ever produced a verified photograph of Shirley Temple. (laughs) It was on the front page of the Daily Mail, which is insane. I mean, this is like Germany has just elected Adolf Hitler, but, you know, there's like (laughs) lots of stuff going on in the world. And the Daily Mail had set itself up as the kind of organ of Nessie mania. The previous year, they had sent a big game hunter and sort of semi-celebrity called Marmaduke Arundel Weatherall. Incredible name. name. I know. And you can picture him, can't you? You know exactly who you're dealing with. They sent him to go and sort of stalk Nessie. And so what he'd done is he'd sent back these plaster casts of these gigantic feet that he'd seen imprinted in the silt and the soil around Loch Ness. But, unfortunately, um, researchers at the Natural History Museum... After a few weeks off for Christmas, which is incredibly British, I feel like, if, you've, if you're actually <laughs> genuinely worried that there's a monster lurking beneath the lake. <laughs> but anyway, they took a few weeks off for Christmas and then they researched these footprints and said no, they'd been made with a dried hippo's foot that you might find on an umbrella stand. And apparently, uh, not to cast dispersions, but apparently Duke Weatherall actually owned a hippo foot umbrella stand. So you can maybe put two and two <laughs> together and see why the Daily Mail weren't thrilled and then promptly fired him. But despite the fact that Wetherill himself had been discredited, the myth continued and people did want to still find evidence themselves and the papers were still hungry to print uh, whatever they could get their hands on, frankly, about this. And so then on April 21st, this day in question, the Daily Mail published what is you know, still the most famous picture of the monster. That's why we all have it in our minds. And it became known as the surgeon's photograph because it was reportedly made by a doctor named Robert Kenneth Wilson. And the photograph depicted that thing that we've seen. It's the the, the neck of Nessie emerging from the water. And for decades, honestly decades, believers then thought that this was the thing and critics then said this wasn't the Loch Ness Monster. And the authenticity was assumed by those who were prepared to believe it simply because... Dr. Robert Kenneth Wilson was doctor. He was a surgeon. The headline in the Daily Mail was London Surgeon's Photo of the Monster. 
And the, the sort of subtext was, a surgeon took it. Why would a surgeon make stuff up? S- doctors aren't weirdos. <laughs> it's a real reminder of how much authority was given to status in those days. I mean, it still is to some extent. But yeah, the very idea that a surgeon couldn't possibly be involved in this, even though like doctors are well known for having a really dark sense of humour anyway. <laughs> exactly. He was actually a gynaecologist, but I presume the Daily Mail back then wasn't prepared to go with London gynaecologists' photo of the monster as their headline. <laughs> but the debate over the authenticity wasn't really helped by the fact that Wilson did not engage any more with the whole subject. Apparently mm. what had happened was that his friend, Morris Chambers, who he'd been hunting with, had sold the photo to the Daily Mail and Wilson had given a bit of comment. You know, he'd given them a few quotes for the front page. But then he got in trouble with the British Medical Association and he was fined £1,000, which was equivalent to £76,000 today. Wow. Because it was deemed a breach of the ethics that he was engaging with this story that was considered to be kind of like a publicity stunt and he was, mm. didn't, he was bringing the profession a dis- repute so he had this amazingly eye-watering fine and then he obviously quickly realized that the whole situation had gotten out of hand and he then didn't engage any further with the story so they couldn't come to him for follow-up information well it's astonishing too how many professional organized searches there were for nessie which began in 1934 when 20 men were each paid two pounds a day to go out and be monster watchers uh, but they spotted nothing and then the thatcher government uh, seriously considered an official loch ness monster hunt and there was even talk of using dolphins from America to help look for it. But then there was this major uh, sonar exploration of Loch Ness uh, in 1987 called Operation Deep Scan, where they used a flotilla of 24 boats and one million pounds worth of equipment to scan the lake. And they basically found nothing again Perhaps unsurprisingly for any sceptics, but very surprisingly for, you know, the Loch Ness aficionado who thought (laughs) that this was going to be the big one. So for around 50 years, there was a lot of questioning amongst people who cared about this stuff. And remember, there wasn't the internet, so you had to go and buy books and attend conferences and stuff. It was a hobby, right? Um, And people were speculating, like, looking at this photo, the surgeon's photo, was it the dorsal fin of a whale? Was it actually something quite small? Because when you looked at the uncropped version of the photo, you can make out the shore, which puts it into perspective as about yeah. 30 centimetres long, which is smaller than what most people thought. <laughs> and so the first major repudiation of the surgeon's photograph came in this article in 1975 in the Sunday Telegraph, which didn't make a huge splash at the time. You can't when you're only 30 centimetres long. So, <laughs> well, yes, because it turns out that... Nessie was actually a toy submarine purchased at a Woolworths in Richmond, London. And we know this because Duke Wetherill's son, Ian, says he was actually there when the surgeon's photo was taken. It seems like this friend of Dr. Wilson's, this Morris Chambers, was also somehow mutually friends with Duke Wetherill, and that's how Duke Wetherill got brought into it. But in that incarnation in The Telegraph in the 70s, this information was in a diary column. It was presented as sort of gossip, a theory, a bit of fun, light reading, not a front page splash. No one basically noticed for another 20 years. It wasn't until 1994, 60 years after the surgeon's photo had graced the pages of the Daily Mail, that Sperling actually started yapping and said, I'm the stepson of Marmaduke Wetherill. Marmaduke Wetherill was humiliated by the Daily Mail and wanted to set out to uh, humiliate them. So we staged the photo together. It was a toy submarine that we bought from Woolworths. And uh, for 60 years, I've kept quiet about it. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, and that Wilson was willing to get involved because he was just a guy who liked a practical joke, which which for someone who then lost his reputation, lost a thousand pounds, which would have been quite a lot of money back then, and was, you know, just just shy of being struck off as a doctor altogether, is um, it's not the funniest joke that you could get involved in, I guess. <laughs> well, what, um, other, but what there was... other 1930s gynaecologists are we still talking about in 2022? <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, maybe it was worth it in the end. But there was further analysis that had been done by the British Journal of Photography and an article that was actually in the 80s arrived at that same conclusion that basically, you know, Once you cropped in, this looked like a very large creature. But if you saw the complete image with the shoreline in the background, it was pretty obvious that this was something small. And that lent further credence to this suggestion that actually it was a toy submarine, precisely as Sperling said. I mean, my favourite bit of recent excitement around the Loch Ness Monster was in 2016, when a drone 
located a Nessie-shaped object at the bottom of the lock. Had she drowned? <laughs> I mean, how can you describe something as a Nessie-shaped object? <laughs> well, it was Nessie-shaped because it was an abandoned prop from a 1970 Billy Wilder film, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, of the Loch Ness Monster, Amazing. which the film crew just allowed to drop to the bottom of the lock. That's what's in there. Like I mean, nothing to be else. fair, that's the, it's, it's the only verified Nessie sighting. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. He seems like Jules Verne telling his own wonderful performances, or like a contemporary Sinbad the Sailor. Love the show? Support the show! Patreon.com slash Retrospectors! Part of the ACAST Creator Network.